Good morning again, LifePoint Crossing. So glad you are here. So glad you came back after last week. If you were here last week, or if you're not back and you're just here, I'm so glad that last week wasn't your first week, or you may have never come back and you would have left with a wildly distorted view of what God and LifePoint Crossing are about. So obviously, if you go to the context clues, we're in a series called Perfect. The general concept is if, if someone were to sit down and think of, you know, how would I love God to be if it was up to me? Like, what, what kind of fictitious God could I create? How would that be or be different from the God of reality, the God of scripture. And so we've had some good weeks. We started out, week one was great. We said, God is powerful. He's, he's a God who can do whatever it is that he wants to do. If you're praying, you're not just saying words into the wind. He can hear, he can act. This is really good news. We all liked that. Then week two, we said, he's unchanging. The God who created everything in Genesis 1-1 is the same God who ultimately defeated Satan and evil in Revelation 20 is the same God through the Old Testament and the New Testament and Missouri 2023. I don't know about 2020, that has, but 2023 at least for sure. And that he's not going to get traded to the dolphins. He's not going to put out an, an album that you don't like. He's consistent. He's reliable. And we all said, this is great. I love this. I love God. I love Life Point Crossing. Ross's messages are the best. And then came last week. He didn't like that. I didn't like parts of that either because last week we talked about how really th there are parts that you would like. If you were to hope for a God, you would hope and want for him to be just. There's something in us, every one of us, that values justice. And we all also know that human beings mess that up. So it's really great news that the judge is going to be God and, and that he's just. That we get exactly what we want on that. But the bad news was also pretty bad because we didn't go all the way down and through the rabbit hole. But the situation is that when we as finite created human beings, when we rebel and sin against the infinite holy creator God, there's still something has to happen for justice to be satisfied. There has to be consequence for wrongdoing. And when, when we sin, right, what, what God as the judge would see or, or determine to be sin, that turns out to be far more serious than it would appear to any human court or to our friends or someone on YouTube or, or even you and me. Because what could a created human being possibly do to repay the infinite holy creator God? He owns us anyway. And so really it turns out our, the, the debt that we would owe then turn, is, is effectively infinite. Well, I can't pay that. I can't even imagine that. I can't even start with that, right? Like the progress bar will never get to 1%. And so in the God's justice, what, what that ends up meaning is that we well, last week, I mean, we used the H word. And so this was something that, if there was something there that you didn't like, then I didn't like that either. But I also said, you have to come back today. You have to come back today or you won't really understand. So I'm so glad that you're back or if you're not back, that's kind of how we got to where we are here for today. And we're going to look at really quite a, a bit of scripture in a way that we don't always necessarily do, but we're going to be starting in Romans chapter 3 today. And it just so beautifully and perfectly perfectly encapsulates what we're talking about. And what this is starting with is really just a, a string of quotations from what we would call our Old Testament. And I'm actually cutting it out halfway through, but it starts, he says, Romans 3, 10 through 12, it says, as the scriptures say, right? So this is going to be quotes from scriptures. No one is true. No one is righteous. Like not even one, like not even one. No one is truly wise wise would be seeking God. Well, no one is doing that. No one's seeking God. All have turned away. Okay, but, but there's still got to be some usefulness, right? All have become useless. No one does good. Not a single one. Not a single 
one. And so if you read that and you think that sounds very damning, then you might be a very good biblical interpreter. And, and if you think, well, this kind of seems like this extends to like everybody, like you and me, then I think Paul writing Romans is saying, okay, yes, you're, you're, you're getting it. This is exactly the point. And he says it even a little bit more straightforwardly. If you skip down just a couple of verses to, to verse 20, he says, for no one can ever be made right with God. Interesting phrase. By doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. And of course, by law, he means effectively, again, what we call our Old Testament. And with Jesus, law went from being really, really difficult to come on. Maybe if you were living in Old Testament times and you made the center of your life obeying and fulfilling the law, I don't know, it'd be pretty tricky, but maybe you could do that. Then Jesus came and he said, okay, well, so, you know, the law says things like, you know, keep revenge under control, an eye for an eye, let's not let get things out of hand. And Jesus then said, okay, well, how about just don't, in fact, forgive people. You went from don't murder, and we think, okay, probably I can handle this one. Most of us probably have a better than 50% chance of being able to make it through life without murder. And so then Jesus says, well, let's go from that to just don't even harbor hatred or bitterness towards someone. And like, God, have you met some of these people? <laughs> and he says, you know, he goes from, I know you all love your, your, your friends, I think you should just love everybody. I love your enemies. Like, come on. Like, they're my, there's a reason they're my enemies. This is ridiculous. Nobody's going to be able to do Not even close. And so Paul says, you know what? You're getting it. And so this is a real problem for every human being. And you're like, Ross, I thought today was going to be happier. Here are some of the greatest words ever written in the history of our planet. But, but now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. And interesting, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. So God's shown us a way to be made right, which is, again, that's implicit that unless something happens for us to be made right, then that's, that's not the case. But this is without keeping the requirements of the law. And, and so this is something that's new, right? But now God has shown it, although he makes the interesting point that it's really not all that new. This has actually been written about for centuries. Moses and the prophets is really just sort of a shorthand way of saying, again, what we would call Old Testament. And so he's, this is we can see it now because now God's shown it, but this has really been pointed to all along, which I think is, is very interesting, and here's what it is. It says we are made right with God, how? Well, by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are, which really he, what he means there is just if you're, you're a Jew, if you're not a Jew, either way, of course, that's a, a strong theme that goes all the way through Romans and a lot of the New Testament. But what's new here is, is that now we're made right with God by, by placing our faith with Jesus instead of by doing the right things or not doing the wrong things. And that does sound like good news. That sounds really good, but how, how does that work? It doesn't make any sense. How can my faith in somebody else, how can that satisfy the justice between me and the infinite holy creator God? Well, he's glad you asked. He has the beginnings of the answer. He says, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. And we know we've kind of covered, like we get that we've all sinned. Although I think this is very helpful, the way this phrase is with falling short of God's glorious standard. Because we all tend to think of things from quite naturally a human perspective or standard, right? So whatever we think would be a good person, like I don't hurt children or puppies. I pay my taxes. I've never been arrested or put in prison. At least not for something that should have been illegal. Eagle, right? But the human standard, or maybe even you have, we're glad. This is a good message for whoever you are, whatever your situation is. But God, as the judge, of course, is going to be his standard that's going ultimately to be accounted to. And so that is what we all fall short of. But yet, God, look at this with undeserved kindness, he declares that we are righteous. 
How did he do that? Well, he did that through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sin. And so again, you see how this is so explicitly laid out, that, that we have sin and there's a penalty for that, and justice has to be satisfied. If God just pretended that nothing happened or looked the other way, that wouldn't be just, that wouldn't be good. And so we still can't pay anything back to the infinite God who created us, so anything that will improve our standing before God has to be necessarily undeserved. And so that's exactly what this says. It is with undeserved kindness that he declares we're righteous. And so now it might seem, if we were to stop here, like God has turned very, very kind. But maybe not so just. Right now maybe does it sound a little bit like God's just the gentle grandpa in the sky who says, oh, you kids burned down the barn. Well, that's all right. Oh, grandma was still inside. Well, she was pretty old. Who wants ice cream? Well, so... As much as we all appreciate some undeserved kindness, justice still has to be satisfied. How is that accomplished? Here's how. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. Now, people are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life shedding his blood. And this sacrifice shows that God was being fair. This is very interesting how he makes a major point of, of, of God's eternal justice here, really, even from the past, right? He was being fair even when he hold, held back and did not punish those who'd sinned in times past, okay? For he was looking ahead and including them at what he would do in this present time, which of course was 2,000 years ago, so that present time is now our past tense. But God did this, look, to demonstrate his righteousness. For he himself is fair and just. And look, in the very same breath as declaring and, and confirming God's justice, he declares sinners, we're still sinners, there's no you know, getting around that, but declares sinners to be right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. The word gospel literally means good news. This is the gospel. This is John 3.16. It's just spelled out in a little more detail and kind of shot with a little bit of a wider angle lens. That God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin, right? Not for his sin because he had none, but for your sin, for my sin. And because, listen, because he was himself very God, this is so amazing, that his righteousness was literally infinite, right? And so that infinite debt that we could never even begin to pay, well, his infinite righteousness and having no sin of his own, he actually is able to pay that for us, for, for anybody, everybody who would ever believe. The, the math is tricky, but it really kind of does check out. And then, as also a human being, he was rightly able to stand in our place and satisfy justice for human beings. This is not, this is God holding on to justice, right? He doesn't pretend that nothing happened or look the other way, but he also declares us righteous through Jesus because we are, although it is 100% due to the undeserved kindness. You skip ahead a chapter and it kind of picks up on a similar theme and keeps going. It says, therefore, since we've been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing in God's glory. The whole concept of this series, if you were to think of who or what your ideal God would look like. You would want him to be just. You, you, you would. We, we all would. We all value justice. The piece that you might not like is then what happens, though, when we're on the wrong side of justice. And the piece that you would never include 
because you would never even conceive of such a thing unless you borrowed it from the God of reality and the God of Scripture. But on your own, you would never even imagine that God would be not only just, but also so outrageously loving that he then steps in and himself satisfies justice on our behalf. And, and the word, of course, undeserved or undeserving has shown up a couple of times here. And that's actually highlighted even more in the next couple of verses in a second here in, in a shockingly stark way. That's my favorite, probably, verses in the entire Bible. I know I probably say that every two or three weeks. But listen, here's, here's before we get there, here's how I'm like God and how I'm not. Is I'm loving. It's awesome. You, know, you probably can relate to that, right? You probably think of yourself as loving. I know a lot of you. You are loving. I'm not even going to say you're not. Yeah, you're loving. That's awesome. Full support on that. Here's, here's how I'm loving is over the years, Laura and I have had you know, different opportunities to do some really cool things for people. Most of them Laura's idea, of course, but I generally think they're good ideas. And so particularly, there was one several years ago where there were some mutual friends of ours. Really, it was Laura's friend from work, but we kind of all became friends. And they'd been together forever. There were two kids in their household, all of this. Uh, and then a couple of years prior, however, they had fairly dramatically come to follow Jesus. Really pretty amazing story. Um, and so then as time goes on, they thought, well, you know what, if we're going to be serious about this following Jesus, then really we, we need to do the right thing and get married. And so they started trying to save for their dream wedding. It turns out that that's really difficult when you already have two kids in the household and a house payment and everything that goes along with that. So they began to realize that this wasn't going to happen. So they said, you know what, we'll just do the best we can. It won't be the perfect dream wedding, but it'll be good enough. It'll be good. Let's just do it. Full support. Great decision. Really looking to do what's right. We love it. And so Laura at one point mentions to her friend, she says, hey, you know, is there any sort of honeymoon? Honeymoon? That is not in the budget. There are two kids in the household. There's no such thing as a trip alone when you're in that sort of situation. Well, Laura loves her friend. And she sees him trying to do what's right. And this is the kind of thing that a person like her is really going to want to support. And so she starts talking to some other mutual friends. And she says, you know what? What if we all chipped in? And I mean, we can't send him to Paris, but we could get him a couple of nights at a, a nice place that's not too far away just to, to have a little bit of time to celebrate their new marriage. And, and if everyone chips in, and, and you know what, we're actually close enough, like we can watch their kids for a couple of days, so we'll take that, and, and that's not weird. And people get behind this kind of thing because these are great people. They're working hard. They're making the right decisions. They're making the right choices. They're trying to do everything right. And so people sacrificed. It took money. It took energy. I sacrificed a prime New Hampshire hiking day because I had to pick their kids up after school, which is a whole fun story in itself for some other day. But, but we, we, we all sacrificed. And, and it was the kind of thing, though, that you would say, well, good. You know what? They're the kind of people who someone should do something awesome for them. That, that's good. That's right. Here's how I'm not like God. It's when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. So now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person. Though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who's especially good. This is me and Laura trying to help out our friends. We weren't trying to die for them exactly, but they're, they're good people. They're trying to do the best. If someone deserves a break, well, it's, it's, it's them. But God showed his great love for us. By sending Christ to die, not when we were really trying to turn things around and we're doing a good job, while we were still sinners. He says, since we've been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still, look, we were his enemies. 
We were his enemies. We were the last people, just as a race. I know we weren't alive at that time individually, but we were, we were the last people that anybody would want to sacrifice anything for if they were in their right mind, unless they had some sort of a love that we would never be able to fathom. Because while we were still his enemies, is when Jesus says, I'll die for them, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God. Because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. And there you see how in Romans we go from being enemies of God to being his friends. Sometimes Jesus talks in terms of we go from being servants to like adopted children and and heirs now in the, the family of God. And how or why does this happen? Because of God's incredible love for us. If you were creating your own individualized God, however you would like he, she, they to be. I don't know if you would ever even think of having them care for their creation. If you did, again, I suspect you might, might be because you're borrowing it from the the God of Scripture, but, but maybe you would think that sounded good. Maybe even if you're quite bold, you might wish for your God to love his creation. That seems like a lot to ask, but maybe you're quite bold. How would you wish then for your God to show that love? I don't know, maybe you could make a great, big, beautiful world with mountains and oceans and lakes and deserts and blue skies and green grass. Maybe give us other people to travel through life with, to, to love and to, to laugh. Maybe he'd give us dogs, cats, or amazing huge birds, or amazing tiny birds. Maybe you would never think of this. You would never think of this. Maybe you would, you would give us this inexplicable thing called music, where just certain disturbances in that atmosphere end up giving us this incredible pleasure and, and, and deep connection. And so there's this amazing thing, in, inexplicable to me, called music. Maybe, maybe if you were really quite bold, you would hope that God would show his love for his creation with things like that, if you're really, really quite bold. But then when his creation turns away, goes their own way, rejects the authority and instruction of the one who created them in the first place, well then, I, I guess they just get what they deserve. And who could really argue with that? But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Jesus Christ when he freed us from the penalty of our sins by presenting Jesus as the sacrifice for our sins. He holds on to justice by absorbing it himself. And shows us love like the world had never seen. And none of us would have ever imagined. You guys, I know life is filled with stuff. A lot of it's difficult. A lot of it's painful. Some of it's your own fault. Some of it really, really isn't. And so it's easy to, to look around and to say, well, you know what? If, if God loves me, I don't, I don't think I see it. I mean, that's great that there's some words written in a book and maybe he, you know, parted the Red Sea for Moses thousands of years ago and all that. But I don't know, if I'm really going to believe, I I need to see something and it had better be pretty impressive. This is the God who loves you so much that Jesus left his eternal dwelling in heaven, came as a human being, lived 33 years as a human being, culminating in 
taking a brutal physical death that we deserved for our sin, as well as carrying the weight of sin and guilt for everyone who would ever believe in him. Why? So we could have, so you could have the opportunity to go from his enemy to his friend. And so I know life is still difficult. I, I know that your marriage is a mess, or you aren't married and you wished you were, or you don't know how you're going to be able to pay your bills this weekend, or you don't have the, the job or the house that you would like or think you deserve or, or whatever. Like all things that we you know, really talk about a, a pretty fair amount. But, but this, this is why we get a little bit excited about Jesus up in here from time to time. This is why we can do nothing but give our whole lives back to him in love and gratitude. This is even why we might mention him to you from time to time. It's not because we're trying to be weird or make things awkward. It's because if this is true, and we think there's very good reason to believe that it is, what else could a person possibly do? For God loves the world. That means you so much that this happened in real time and space. It was just a few years ago and on the other side of the world that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And next week, I don't know if I could say it's as good, but it's almost as unthinkable. Let's pray. Father, what can we say? What can we say when we think about and dwell on these truths and these realities that we were completely undeserving and in rebellion is your enemies and in that moment, because of your incredible love, Jesus came and died for me. Still praying. If you're here, maybe, maybe for whatever reason, things have never quite clicked or never made sense or just didn't seem like it could be true, but maybe for you, this is your day. This is your moment to step into that, to become one of the everyone who believes in him, to receive that forgiveness, to allow Jesus' sacrifice to stand as justice in your place before the holy and creator God because he loves you. Listen, this is your moment. This is your day. If you're here in the, the building with us, if you're watching online, you just pray and, and talk to God. You can say out loud or even in, his, in, your, in your heart, and he'll hear you. Pray something like this. Pray, God, I believe that Jesus came and died and resurrected so that I could be forgiven and adopted as a child in your family. Please come into my life. Don't forgive me and adopt me. Begin to make me into the person you created me to be. And give me the life that you have for me. If you just made that decision and prayed a prayer like that, it's, it's not the words or the prayer that saves you. It's that you put your faith in Jesus like these verses have said, and God's grace comes to you through that. You are forgiven. And a new spiritual creation in him, the greatest thing you can do from here is you are not created then to, to do this alone. Let somebody know. You can go out to the, the point, that's just the corner in the lobby, and let the person there know about your decision. They'll take your information. We'll be able to follow up with you and have you pointed down a good path and taking some good, healthy steps in your new life. If you're online, send us a message. Let us know. And we are so excited about what God what God has done 2,000 years ago and the way that is impacting and transforming lives and eternities from Missouri 2023 and going forward. And the rest of us, um, a lot of us I know this is elementary and we've known and heard about this for decades and, and maybe our whole lives. Others of us, I, maybe it's a little new or whatever, maybe haven't quite heard it in, in this type of fashion, but still the, the basic principles we know, but what can we do but give our entire lives back to God? What, what else would we want to do? What else would be right? Father, we love you. We praise you, we worship you, our entire lives are yours. Father, take us 
and use us for your glory. And we do so, so easily with the knowledge and the understanding that you love us so much that in doing so and in being who you've created us to be will be the greatest not only for your glory in the world we live in, but for ourselves as well. We could never imagine so great a God, but we love you and we are unspeakably privileged to be your people and live in your world. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.